What is crackling, everybody? Welcome on into the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today... PGA is back for the Charles Schwab Challenge that is coming up this weekend at Colonial Country Club, and we are here to break it all down from a DFS perspective. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here again, I can't say as always, because it's been like six decades, but joined here once again by Brandon Gandula. He is the managing editor for NumberFire. Brandon, hello. It's been like 15 years. How are you? Yeah, it's been since, I guess, the draft, the NFL draft was the last time we did anything. I believe so. Um, Because the players was not after the draft. And so, yeah, it's been it's been a minute or two. Uh, It's I don't even I don't even slack you like I kind (laughs) of just our slack, you know, ever since we stopped having the the podcast, I don't really talk to you at all. Kind of go out of my way not to interact with you i try yeah i try sometimes i can't avoid it because i have to like tilt at you about something menial that i can like ruin your day with uh but outside of that you know like i've just been like a lost duck floating through this these waters drifting by myself with uh with nothing to do we've had we did have a league of legends uh podcast oh yeah we did um we had i've done some ufc podcasts and some nascar podcasts uh, we were talking before about which golfers we'd want to see in like a UFC fight against each other. I think the the Bryson Brooks one is the most the one I, I am most intrigued by. But like, we get to watch some golf this weekend. I don't have to do fantasies about Brooks Kepka just you know one shot KO and Bryson DeChambeau. This is great. Uh, well, that's not what you said before the podcast. You were pretty in on no, no, Bryson. No, 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 no. I revised. I I listened to what you said. Reacted and adjusted my thoughts accordingly. When we get new information, we should be willing to adapt our thoughts to that, and that's what I did. Mm, I don't know. I feel like doubling down and, and just uh, ignoring any evidence to the contrary is the, the better way to go. Facts are overrated and <laughs> counter to what we're going for in general here. But we do have a full podcast for today. We're going to break down the Charles Schwab Challenge from a DFS perspective, let you know the intricacies of the court. Uh, court? course see we're out of practice this is great (laughs) the intricacies of the course we're going to go through golfers who were doing well before the break we don't know if they're still good because it's been three months but we'll talk about all that and break down our thoughts on this field here today in just a bit but first quick reminder to subscribe to the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed wherever you get your podcast no ufc podcast this week because the card apparently for saturday according to austin is not as good so no ufc podcast this week but two nascar podcasts one on tuesday for the Wednesday race in in Martinsville, and then one on Friday morning for the Sunday race in Homestead. I am having trouble keeping track of which races are when, but Martinsville, then Homestead. So make sure you are subscribed so so that you can know when they're out, because I clearly do not. So just make sure you are subscribed. If you like what you hear, please leave us a rating and review as well. The Charles Schwab Challenge is taking place at Colonial Country Club. It is 7,209 yards, and it is a par 70. And a lot of you... Playing this weekend may not have played PGA DFS in a while, in which case, welcome back. But in case you have not played since September, it is important to note the cut rules changed. Uh, They used to have the top 70 plus ties made it, and then there could be secondary cuts, etc., etc. But now it is just the top 65 plus ties make the cut after the first two rounds. There is no more secondary cut, uh, which means that, oh, you don't have to worry if your guys make it to Saturday— But it does make it harder to find guys to make the cut, as our lineups would be evidence of from the fall and parts of this winter as well. So top 65 plus ties make it. There are 148 golfers in the field, so a lot of dudes ain't going to make it to Saturday and Sunday. Brandon, let's look specifically at Colonial Country Club. What do we need to know about this course, and how does it impact it from a DFS perspective? Yeah, so Colonial's not overly long uh it's a course that generally rewards accuracy more than distance which is pretty intuitive if you just look at the course overview like the actual kind of flyover there are a lot of fairway bunkers a lot of bunkers uh small greens but uh accuracy over distance which is typically pretty rare uh throughout the season but it is the case 
uh, this week as they return to the PGA Tour. Stroke scan approach is going to be key as usual. Um, the problem probably is that we don't know whose irons are necessarily in form. Uh, there are, again, a lot of bunkers guarding the greens, so kind of avoiding trouble. So hitting fairways and then having good approach shots, uh, hitting greens in regulation, uh, that gets rolled up in that for me. It's really not a super easy course either. <laughs> uh, fantasy scoring could be held in check. Uh, last year or last season, no, last year, I just do it by year because it's easier. Um, it ranked 36 out of 41 courses where I have data and average FanDuel points. So not a ton of scoring here. Uh, so I'm really looking for ball striking, uh, despite de-emphasizing distance a little bit. So really iron play, greens and regulation, uh, fairways hit. So it's kind of a good list week to week. Um, but, you know, really just trying to go back to the more proven ball strikers coming back uh, to the PGA Tour whenever I can, depending on salaries. So my key stats, strokes gain approach, driving accuracy, greens and regulation, a little bit of strokes gain around the green. Uh, and some bogey avoidance as well because the course is difficult. Yeah, looking back at, at past years and what golfers have done based on where they rank for the full season, if you go back to 2018, the median ranking in driving accuracy for the top 20 golfers in that field for the full season was 58th versus 108th for driving distance. So that's not a split you see usually. And I have generally been inclined to go with like good drive rate or something like that to account for things in general uh when we've had situations like this but like dist or accuracy outperforms good drive rate even by such a wide margin that i did wind up going to accuracy too and like like you said it kind of makes sense once you see the course to skew that direction so we're on the same page there for sure the one question we could have is like you know we don't really know how accurate the stats are so brandon usually when we're looking at the stats we're pulling the past 50 rounds from fantasy national did you change that at all to account for the fact that we don't know what's going on? Because I could see it both ways. Like, on the one hand, if you go past 100 rounds, your your sample is, like, probably a full like a, a full calendar year for some guys. And that's, that's a long way. But also, it may just give us – it may counteract some golfers who were in weird form entering the break they may have corrected since then. So how did you alter things from a stats perspective to account for the layoff? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, golf's that – probably the the weirdest sport with this because there's a lot of data now um but the data can get a little tricky and there's a lot of that eye test that goes into you know whether someone hits a green or hits a, a fairway by like a foot or not and if you really watch you can see you know who's doing what but uh really the most predictive stats come from like the past two years if you just look at larger samples it makes a lot of sense uh because then we're not buying into uh, short samples from golfers who just happen to kind of hit the high end of their variance or have something click. So I would actually think that there's nothing wrong with uh, making that, making the sample you look at larger than normal. And then uh, as far as like the short sample stuff goes, like I still use, I think 50 rounds is fine. But yeah. if you're looking at like the past 24 or 12 rounds, if you like that's kind of something that you do whenever the PGA tour is moving along, you're like, I want to figure out who's doing well, like in, like in the, in the immediate uh, past, I don't think that that's going to, going to really, gonna really real, uh, yield good results. Yeah, Cause like you said, sometimes guys can just be locked in and like that. They're not going to remain locked in after a, a three month shutdown. Like I know they've been able to play golf for a while, but like it's hard yeah. to stay, to keep a, a heater going. It has to be like, sustainable changes that are made and it's hard to find sustainable changes over a 12 or 24 round sample so i'd agree with that just broadening things out maybe discounting guys who were in a weird funk before the break and things like that uh there's one golfer specifically i hope has broken out of a funk that he was in before the break uh because if not i could have some bad lineups for sunday one other question that i have for you brandon is like something we discuss a lot here on the podcast is Past history versus current form. Their history at the course versus what they've done recently. The reason, at least I have always said, course or, or current form over everything is that golfers change over a long period of time. And I want to know who is golfing really well right now and then make minor adjustments for course history. Here, we don't really know who's golfing really well right now. So is that going to change the way 
the way that you weigh, that's really difficult to say, the way you weigh history versus current form for this week? So it makes sense to think that way. Yeah. The problem is that this invitational event is usually not as, nearly as strong as it is this week. It's yeah. usually a much smaller field. Um, and, I mean, we had... Uh, if you if you just kind of dig back and you look at like oh you know Kevin Na nah, has no, great no, no, form. Let's not let's not trash Kevin Na, Kevin Kisner guy. Let's like let's Gary I guess Justin Rose, who clearly had the best form before the break. Yeah, so I mean it's such a loaded like layered response because would Kevin Na have won if it were this field? Totally. Would he have gained? I mean his approach numbers were great. Uh, those those two years at the Charles Schwab uh, when he finished f- first and fourth, tr- maybe I'm hopefully I'm not spoiling too much here, but I mean, would he have gained that many strokes over this field? 100%. Probably not. No, no. So totally. when when you factor that in, and then you know you've had some golfers say like it's going to be weird playing certain certain courses without grandstands, without fans, it's going to play a little bit differently, uh, and we haven't really talked about it, but you know another reason to to emphasize accuracy is. I'm not saying some of these guys are going to lose golf balls and and that this is going to be decided by like lost golf balls, but it's very much more likely that guys spray it uh, and can't find their ball because there's not, you know, those four or five guys just sprinting after the ball and holding everyone off. So I understand the case for kind of looking more at course history here for this week and for these upcoming weeks, but I think it's going to play a little bit different than it typically does anyway. So I'm probably not going to raise it up too much. Yeah, I think I want to do the same uh, for different reasons. But for like me, it's hard to put a lot of emphasis on course history when they go there once per year. Like for NASCAR, when they go to a track twice in a year, my sample on a driver at a certain track is twice as large if I look at just 2019. Whereas with golfers, sure, they do four rounds sometimes but like it's still going to be one event if they had like a weird night of sleep wednesday that can ruin their entire weekend so i I think i'm still going to lean the way you were saying where i'm going to value current form more than i value uh you know course history but it is at least a discussion to me about you know which way we should go but i think that your answer is correct there for sure yeah, I mean, you can, and, and look, you can do anything you want coming out of this hiatus. You can look at Instagram. You can look at Twitter. You can see what Twitch. You can, golden T Twitch. See what they've been doing on their golden T machines. I didn't actually know that was a thing. I, um, I follow a guy on Twitter who is, in, I think it's Golden T, um, who like is in like Golden T competitions. Um, he's not a golfer, so I don't know why I'm bringing this up. This is not relevant, but. I mean, there's too much. I mean, even even in the hiatus, there's like too much to kind of follow. But yeah, you can kind of look and see which guys are posting a lot. But uh, speaking of someone who's kind of this way, if I were practicing every day, I'm not going to post about it. Uh, I think a few golfers off the top of my head wouldn't really do that. Specifically, one golfer I think we both like a lot, uh, my boy Xander. I follow him on like social media. He he doesn't really do much, but there's no way that he's not out there like practicing and grinding. He's young. He doesn't have a family, so like, you know, we might see some like someone with a, a family who's posting all these scores, talking about how how many uh, rounds he's gotten in. But we don't know what other guys are doing, so I think it's all kind of just but not if really you worth practice it. and don't post about it. Does it actually count? <laughs> I think I think uh, Carry On Johnson posed that question a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Did he? Like actually? Yeah, I think I think there was a uh, again. I, I don't really follow this stuff too much, but I think there was a picture of Matthew Stafford and DeAndre Swift working out together oh. and Carry On with his uh, either girlfriend or fiance. I, I don't want to get that wrong, but I, I don't actually know. Yeah. And then I guess he's like getting some flack for it, and his response was effectively, you know, it's possible to work out and like not post about it. <laughs> I don't think he's right. I, I, I like Carry On Johnson, but I'm going to have to disagree with him on this one. If you're not posting about it, it doesn't exist. That's just, that's the way life is. So react, dig into the Twitch streams, dig into the Insta videos, TikTok, I don't know, whatever it may be, find out. And if, the, if they're not posting, 
They're not worth it. That's just the rule. The PGA DFS this week. The PGA is back in a big way this weekend with a massive daily fantasy contest on FanDuel. This week's Mega Eagle contest includes $1 million in total prizes, with first place netting $100,000. Best of all, it is only $7 to enter. $7 to enter for a chance at $100,000. To get yourself a chance at all that cash, go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app eligibility restrictions apply let's go into past history here as mentioned the regular caveats apply of we do want to put more more weight into current form but we can look back and see which golfers have been here which golfers have done well and one of them is John Rom. John Rom, a couple of top fives here recently, and obviously we know the current form is good too. So talk me through John Rom and how you're viewing him at 11-9 for this weekend. Yes, he's the second most expensive golfer on FanDuel. Very much worth it. Uh, his price, you know, in his own right, was definitely one of the best golfers in the world entering this hiatus. Uh, he's going to cost us this week, but again, it's really hard to hate John Rom right now. I uh, missed the cut at Colonial last year, which is kind of strange to discuss in this section. And the way he did it was a little concerning. Uh, according to Fantasy National, lost 4.2 strokes tee to green, 3.1 from approach specifically. But that was right after missing the cut at the PGA. Uh, the year prior, uh, he finished fifth while gaining 6.2 strokes tee to green. Uh, followed that up with a T2, uh, or, you know, uh, that was after a T2 in 2017 when he gained 11.4 strokes T to green to lead the field pretty comfortably there. So a uh, really good form T to green here. And anytime you're looking at past results, uh, the results are fine, uh, but I prefer strokes gain data, uh, specifically strokes gain T to green. And we've seen Rom do uh, really well uh, twice here. There's kind of no reason to think that he would come back with a ton of rust. So, uh, he's going to cost us, but uh, I think I'm going to go hard at him. I'm really trying to figure out how I'm, how I'm approaching this one. Uh, I, I want, obviously, access to the high-end guys. Rom is definitely on my short list, but trying to figure out. It's probably going to be more of a balanced build, so uh, either way, John Rom is, is, is on my short list. So I think from a roster construction perspective, I may be on a different spot because the way that I view it is like, when driving distance is not as much of an emphasis, in my eyes at least, and this could be wrong, the pool of golfers who can finish top 10 is larger. And that to me blend, or lends itself more towards being okay with more of a top heavy roster. I'm not saying like all out starts and scrubs because like there is a cut and we needed to consider that, but I am okay. There are several golfers in the 8,000 range who I think are like legit contenders for a top 15, top 25 finish. So I'm okay with spending up, but I still need to prioritize. And we'll talk about Rory McIlroy later on in the odds section. He's a separate subject here. But I think when I'm looking at John Rom compared to Justin Thomas, Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau, I think Rom is pretty easily at the top of that list to me, where I'd put him above all those guys. The question is... Like, do I go back to, to, to DJ and Brooks hoping they fixed what was ailing them before the break? Or do I decide to commit and go to John Rahm? I, in a, in a field where I have limited information because we haven't seen these golfers in such a long time, I am more inclined to not commit outside of Rory. Again, we'll talk about him later. Uh, but I think that's the big question I have. So from a ranking perspective, Rahm is number one for me there. But I'm not sure how committed I feel to that just because of the lack of information. What about for you? Yeah, I think this is a good week uh, to kind of take a stand on which types of golfers you're valuing, whether it is just the guys who are hyper accurate or who get the biggest boost from whenever we're looking just at accuracy and not counting for distance. If we're looking for guys who are just really in good, really, uh, really good form entering, which probably not something I'm doing, uh, I think the guys I've really been keying in on are some younger golfers who have holes in their game, specific, specifically things like short game that can kind of get fixed a little more easy. Um, so that's kind of the way that I'm going. Rom, for that reason, still fits. Uh, I, you have to think that John Rom's doing everything he can to stay at the top of his game. Uh, so Rom probably at the top of that tier, or he is at the top of that tier behind Rory for me. 
Bigger problem is he's only three hundred dollars cheaper than Rory, so that's yeah. always tough. Uh, because Rory, I mean, I kind of have to like. So when I build up my simulations, uh, you kind of have to like scale that back a little bit with how good Rory was. But yeah. even when you do that, like his win odds are just substantially higher than anybody else's. So right. uh, I mean, if you're trusting the data, Rory's still the play. But uh, Rom, if he happens to go a little bit overlooked just because it's like hey Rory's $300 more and we have so many other good options then uh, I'll be uh, going in all in on John Rom. I don't think we had this specifically in the rundown anywhere so I do want to ask you about Kepka and DJ they were really bad I think it's fair to say uh, before the layoff is there any inclination on your part to try to get in on them now before we can react to changes they may have made. I guess DJ did finish 10th in one event, but like they weren't good. Uh, so are you inclined to try to get in on them while the salaries and, and popularity may be lower? Yeah. I mean, if we get a read, it's actually earlier than we record normally. So it's even harder to get a read on, uh, you know, who, who's going to get ownership and, yeah. you know, we know it's going to be Rory. It's probably going to be Rom. Uh, JT as well, but uh, I think that this is a like I said, it's it's a good week to take a stand on the golfers you like the most, and I think for that reason, uh, Brooks is an elite tournament play. I would be there with DJ as well, but I just prefer Brooks straight up. Uh, his form wasn't quite so bad. Uh, potentially the time off will help, and Brooks is a guy. I don't know. It could kind of be counter, but he doesn't really talk about practicing a lot like he kind of doesn't <laughs> seem true. to practice much so this time off could either like not affect him that much because he's fine not practicing or he could come out and we learn that he hasn't really touched a golf club but again we've seen him come back from injury and in, in like sure. win majors and stuff so yeah i think they're very interesting and i think that they are people i, I want to at least make sure before thursday morning i give a lot of thought to um i may wind up Still not going there, but I at least want to give a thought because I think that they are really, really interesting for this weekend. Uh, you were also talking about like young players making improvements. I know Byung Han An is not super young; he's like twenty upper twenties. But uh, someone tweeted at him like, "Hey, how's the putter?" And he said, "Hot as always." Uh, so that, that's a, that's what I thought of when you were talking about younger guys working on their game. Just bent on in like a putting green in his office, I assume, just going yeah. going ham. Yeah, I mean, like. It- it's realistic to think that Ben on like became less awful at nope, putting. It's not. <laughs> Let me have this. Nope, one, I'm Jim. cutting you off All there. Right. We are not going to go there. Instead, we're going to talk about Kevin Na. We're giving the Na wave to that sentiment and talking about the other Na. Kevin, uh, the most recent winner at Colonial Country Club, he came through in last year's Charles Schwab Challenge, as you mentioned. And did it in pretty impressive fashion, too, because he beat Tony Finau, who was in second uh, by four strokes. It was Nas' second straight top five finish at this course and his third top ten in his past four tries. Now, Nas did miss uh, two cuts in the first seven events in 2020 before the layoff, but he also was top ten at the WGC Mexico in a tough field. The big issue that I have with Nas is that he's in a really solid tier. That upper 9,000 range is tough. Uh, so are you going to give Nas a run with the impressive course history, or are the other guys drawing you away in that tier? Uh, too many other guys, I think. Um, I, I know that it, $600 is a lot uh, for PGA, but I love Colin Morikawa. I'm going to talk about him more. Uh, Scotty Scheffler is 10,200. We can talk Jordan Spieth. Uh, in a sect at 10,000. Uh, but I mean, even like Matthew Fitzpatrick, Jason Day, Victor Hovland, Daniel Berger was really hot uh, entering. I don't know how that's going to stick around, but I think the reason to like Kevin Na is mostly the course form. Yeah. And the reason to like a lot of these other guys is just a larger sample of stats that look really good. So probably going to just pass on Kevin Na. Uh, I'm always a fan of his, but I really don't think that the price is quite right. And I would just rather go elsewhere. Not anecdotally fits the course because like he's not a super long guy. So like you could make that argument. But a lot of the guys we just touched on are in a similar realm. Like Matthew Fitzpatrick is also not a distance guy and is really good with like his irons, can be good with his short game too. So I think that that kind of takes away the one thing in, in Nas' favor. So 
I don't dislike him. I just don't like him enough to prioritize him in a tier where there are a lot of really good options. One of whom could be Jordan Spieth. Uh, you might have to sell me here. You were talking about geysers and balls. Jordan Spieth may have some issues with that, uh, given his accuracy off the tee of late. So Jordan Spieth, $10,000. What is pushing you to talk about him here for this weekend? Well, the the course history. Uh, we know he's an elite bent grass putter. Uh, he's had great finishes at this course in recent years, which is obviously why we're talking about that. But did so in different ways. Uh, last year, he finished eighth despite gaining only 0.8 strokes tee to green. Uh, lost 1.9 with the approach, but gained seven and a half strokes putting, which is very much an outlier performance. The year prior, though, he gained 7.1 strokes tee to green, lost 3.6 putting. Putting is definitely volatile, even for someone as good uh, with the putter as Jordan Spieth is. I kind of hope that this break was really good for Jordan Spieth, but it could also be very bad for him. Not that it could get much worse, and that's not to say like he's been the world's worst golfer. It's just his ball striking hasn't been there. The swing mechanics, I'm not an expert by any means, but it seems like that's what he needed to work on, and maybe the time off was really good. So the ball striking was still a mess entering the players. He ranks outside the top 110 in approach and off the tee strokes gained uh, over the past 50 rounds, according to Fantasy National. But there are a lot of unknowns, and I think that we're talking about guys like Brooks Kepka and DJ and trying to buy back before the public is like exactly where they should be uh, on these guys. And for someone with Jordan speed, we know what the upside is. It's we've seen him gain a ton of strokes uh, T to green. We know how good the putter can be. And that means that he can put away a win. So for $10,000, I like the idea of a balanced lineup. And I think that Jordan speed is, at least in play, and I was not really there for quite some time before that. So, sounds like he's not doing anything for you. Um, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> accurate. Um, <laughs> so I think the way that I'm viewing it with golfers potentially making corrections over the layoff is dependent on the sample in which they sucked, and the sample on Jordan Spieth not being good off the tee and with his approach play is really big now, and it's been like a couple of years. Whereas with Brooks Kepka and Dustin Johnson, we saw them be dominant like DJ early summer of last year and Kepka, you know, for several years, uh, he was dominant and then has kind of slipped off of late. So the sample of them being terrible is smaller. The same thing is true for like uh, Billy Horschel had a weird stretch uh, over the winter and stuff like that where he was pretty terrible, but like bounced back. The sample on Justin Rowe is struggling is smaller too. So I think if golfers had a, a rough couple of months, I am okay potentially trying to buy low on them. When it's a couple of years, that's more worrisome. So I am still waiting on speed. Again, like my hope with him is that we get an event where his ball striking gets good, but he's terrible on the greens because there I'm going to try to buy in aggressively but I haven't really seen that yet, so I'm still very, very hesitant. And I'm less inclined to buy low on him than I am most other golfers, I think. So I think I'm a bit lower on you, lower than you here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to, like, fight you on it. Yeah. I'm not saying that Jordan Spieth is my favorite golfer in this range. He definitely isn't. Uh, but I think the time off probably is going to do him some good. Uh, it can't the ball do him bad. Like, like, right, I don't that's, think. What I, yeah. that's kind of what I was getting at uh, yeah. before. Um it feels like it's been forever since we've seen good ball striking from him. It's been about two years, uh, just basically a really bad, like 2019 in terms of ball striking. So, but I mean, there are some, there are some events sprinkled in where things look right. pretty good. So, uh, it's, it's definitely possible and he's only 10,000 and you, yeah. you know, he doesn't need to win, but with how good his putter can be, he can jump up like 15 spots in the standings, make some extra birdies, uh, so he's got some appeal for me though. I think that if you're multi entering for tournaments, you're not wasting a slot. If you decide to have a couple sprinkles of Jordan speed, I think that's the way I'd say it. you're not wasting a spot, but if you're building one lineup, you're not playing Jordan speed. There is no chance. I would not consider it. Absolutely not. Um, so yeah, it depends on how you're playing things, but, um, maybe if you're multi entering worth a sprinkle or two, but I... Jim, Jim hates it. So you can just say it. Is Jason? Yeah. So, 
Yeah, I mean, like, there's usually like some dude who I just can't, I can't fathom using. I don't think Jason Day. You know, Jason Day is here. Just kidding. Um, like, like the Jason, Jason Day week. play of the week, where I just can't, I can't fathom possibly using that person. That's kind of like Jordan Speed's not there, but he's like, you know, he's close. I like Let's, Jason Day this week. Okay, you can do that. I'm gonna refrain personally so let's talk about someone brandon whose sample of suckage was a little bit smaller than jordan spieth that's emiliano grillo and grillo his form entering the layoff was was really bad uh he had missed the cut in four of six events before the break that means that he did not miss a cut two times he was disqualified in one of those two times he did get a third place finish that's good but that was at the puerto rico open with a really bad field so grillo the past six events not a whole lot going, but this course might be able to get him back on track because Grillo has made the cut all four times he has played here, including three straight top 25 finishes. One of those was a third place finish in 2018. And Grillo, really cheap, $8,400. He was in better form for those events, which is worth noting, but his stats are still okay. And he's had time to maybe patch things up in his game. So, are you in on Emiliano Grillo as a value play this weekend? Uh, is he on bent grass? He is. That's really the checklist with Grillo mm-hmm. um, in terms of whether you can consider him or not. Again, if you're building one lineup, uh, no. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think maybe this is where we differ because you said that there are some names in the 8,000 range you feel good with. It's Chez. <laughs> So like, well, I, I mean, I like Eric Van Royen. Yeah, I like Eric Van Royen too. Other than other than him, uh, there's Adam Hadwin at nine thousand, but I don't feel great with anybody else, and I really don't even love the low nine thousand range, which is to say like, I I'm not looking in this range a lot, and I want to kind of just build a lineup with like five guys ninety six and above, so that I just feel better with a lot of my golfers as opposed to taking a stab on someone like Grillo. So he's in play because it's bent grass, and we know what the ball striking can be. I wouldn't expect, like, the top three upside in this field because, again, he did that at you know against a weaker field yeah. uh, at this event. But, you know, he gets a top 25. That's definitely viable. Uh, it's just a matter of the odds that he can really separate himself in this tougher field. Yeah, I think for me, it's like... For one lineup, and like especially if it's a cash game lineup, I wouldn't want to go Grillo. Uh, but I would feel comfortable having him as like a fringe core play if I'm multi entering for tournaments. Like that's where I'm at with him. Because if I have someone as a fringe core play for an event where I'm lowering my exposure levels to most golfers, like I'm not going like 10% on everyone, but like if I'm going normally, I'd be 80% Rory to go into 60%. Like, I can have 40% Grillo and still leave 60% of my lineups where, if he sucks, I'm still safeguarded there. So I am comfortable putting him in that fringe core range because I'm safeguarded enough where if he sucks, whatever, it's okay. Like, it doesn't doesn't feel good. But, like, I still have lineups that can go off. And I think that there are other guys in the 8,000 range who I'd put in a similar bucket where they can be fringe core plays – and that's why I can feel okay going a little bit more top heavy. I think that's the way that that's the reason I'm okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't dislike that logic at all, uh, but I think that the odds that you hit, like, let's say all if you're trying to get all six of your golfers in the top ten in this field, I feel like a more balanced way of a more balanced lineup is much more likely because yeah. what's Grillo's ceiling? I mean, I have numbers on like how how. <laughs> How often can he act, finishes? Answer this with with numbers. But to, to to really like figure that out, I mean, I, I won't lie. The optimal lineups that I spit out with that were like Rory, Rom, and then guys like Jim Furyk, and it was like a lot of uh, really cheap guys. I know, yeah. but that's just because that's how good Rory and Rom's right. odds are. Right. I really don't think that's the best way to do it, though. So okay. I'm going to disagree with the numbers and probably build a little bit more balance. But I mean, that's not to say that I don't like Grillo. It's just I, I can only do so much with him That's and fair. not as much as you. Yeah, and again, try to avoid if you can in cash games because I am still worried about those struggles from before carrying over. So cash games, no. 
fringe core play for tournaments, yes. Let's move into current form and look at some golfers who were doing well before the layoff. And one of the best golfers before the layoff was Colin Morikawa. You said you wanted to buy into younger guys who've had some time to work on things in this time off. Morikawa probably doesn't have a ton to work on outside of maybe some stuff with his short game. So what are your thoughts on Morikawa at $10,400? Yeah, I think that's a super cheap price. Uh, it's really, uh, I, I mean, in the field, I understand it. Uh, if this was a typical Charles Schwab, he'd be priced up. But uh, for that price, that really gets access to a really good player. Uh, again, uh, it goes along with the idea that some of these younger players could iron out some of those wrinkles that they have in their game. And we know where more uh, more cow is good, and it's the ball striking uh, leads the field and strokes gain approach over the past 50 rounds. Uh, this field too, like it's not a regular Charles Schwab, so that kind of says a lot. Uh, he he was 25th at the Waste Management, 26th at the Genesis, 42nd at the WGC Mexico, which I'm willing to write off because the elevation there is always uh, problematic for for new guys. Ninth at the Arnold Palmer. And again, I mean, he's also second in the field in strokes gained uh, tee to green over the past 24 rounds, if we if we kind of want to view it from that lens, which again, I really don't. But the, the super recent form entering was really good. Uh, if he gets the putter figured out, if he if his chipping gets a little bit better, uh, he could be one of the most dangerous golfers in the field for weeks to come, not just this week. So uh, he's, he's the kind of player I'm looking for uh, to kind of pull the trigger a little early and get out ahead uh, of uh, everyone else. Yeah, I think for me, like, I'm not going to have, not every lineup that I build, if a multi-end for tournaments is going to be, like, top-heavy. I'm going to have some where I have different roster constructions, because I agree there is some credence to going more balanced. And I think that if I'm going balanced, more cow is, like, perfect. Because in that, like, mid-10,000 range, I would have a hard time putting anybody above him. Like, I don't see anybody I put above him in that range. Tony Finau, I would consider, but, like, he's not a great fit for this course. I know he finished second year last year, but, like, he's not the best fit here. So I think Morikawa would be my one, but I think, like, it, he has to fit in a very specific type of roster build, and I'd rather get, you know, like, Xander Schauffele. We're going to talk about Sung JM in a second. I'd rather get to those guys than go with Morikawa. So... When I go with the balance build, I think that Morikawa would be a key piece to that. So I think from that perspective, I'm, I'm going to be here at least at some point this weekend for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult uh, to to figure out the best way to build lineups this week, mostly because we don't know what to expect. Um, if, we ha if we could be more confident in some of these value plays, uh, I would say I'm w more willing to go Stars and Scrubsy, but I really think I might just try to settle on one stud and, and some balance but it's just it's it's difficult because yeah. if you if you play rory i just started a lineup with rory xander and morikawa and i have 8700 left for the the final three that's not as bad as i thought it'd be um, it's not but you got to play basically grillo yeah van royen i'm not giving out like full lineups here but <laughs> you're kind of like uh, with only liking a, like three value plays I only have like one place to go with that yeah. lineup. Yeah, and I think that that's viable at times, but it's definitely not a default build. Uh, but I think that like if you go Rory, skip over Xander, and go Morikawa as your number two, that gets you more balanced. It gets you fewer value plays, and maybe that's in a better zone where you can probably get back up to the upper 9,000s then. Uh, I'm going to be more inclined to do the opposite and – Build around Xander rather than Rory. Okay. Yeah, I think that's in play too. Because like Xander's, I will talk about Xander later, but I think he's really interesting. So I think that's in play for sure. Let's talk about someone in that same tier as Xander Schauffele, which is Sung Jm, because uh, he's one of the most recent winners on the PGA Tour before the layoff. Uh, that was Sung Jm. He got it done, the Honda Classic, then followed that up with a third at the Arnold Palmer, and then all the wind got taken out of his sails because we had the COVID nineteen layoff. But M backed up those finishes with really solid stats. He gained 6.2 strokes in approach at the Honda Classic. He gained 10.5 tee to green at the Arnold Palmer. A lot of that was uh, around the green, but regardless, still counts. Uh, so that's good. There are two potential issues here. The first one is that Sungjae's better on both Bermuda and Poa than he is on Bankgrass. Uh, 
Sample size issues definitely in play there because Emmett is younger. The second is that this is a really good tier. It's got Webb Simpson at 11-4, t- Xander Schauffele, Patrick Reed, Justin Rose, all within $200 one way or another of Sung Jm. So, Brandon, did Sung J do enough before the layoff for you to target him at 11-2 in a really loaded tier? Yes, but the odds that I play him just realistically are kind of lower than they should be. Like, I'm fine with the price. That's kind of where he deserves to be. But with Xander being only $100 more expensive and with someone like Morikawa at 10-4, it's just a lot easier to either pay up or 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 pay down uh, for one of those two, just because I like Morikawa and Xander so much this week. So Sungjae probably, I mean, just one of these young guys. All he does is golf. He golfs every week, no matter what, to begin with. So, so long as he had a way to golf, he's probably just been playing constantly without the taxation of like tournament style golf. So yeah. he's probably going to come in in really good form. Uh, and I was actually very disappointed to see the price because I figured if he's mid 10 thousands or something, which is not unrealistic because of the other names in that range, he would be a great play. I think right now at the price, he's just an okay play. I think the one thing that helps me get to Sungjae is that I'm probably going to be in this tier more often than you, because I really do like the build of Rory jump down to this tier for my second stuff, whether it be Xander or Sungjae. I do like Webb as well at 11-4, so I think this will be that'll be a popular build for me, and as a result of that, I'll wind up getting to Sungjae at least a bit. He's not my favorite in that tier though, and that's the 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 issue that pushes me away. Yeah, and I, I'm not uh, downplaying a $400 difference, but Brooks at 11.6 or Sungjae at 11.2. Right. That's a. I mean, I don't need to even answer that. I don't think because like I yeah. I think that buying low on Brooks there is really tough to lay off of. So. Yeah. All righty, let's move on Sorry, to a couple of uh, cheaper plays. We haven't talked about the low 9,000 yet, I don't think. No, actually, it's, I don't not, it's not very enticing. That's why I don't really want to get too bogged down in, in the I value. like the mid 9.5. The, <laughs> 9.5 was, it came out of my mouth on purpose because that's <laughs> kind of the cutoff of where the, the fall off is. But there are a couple of guys in the low 9,000s who could be intriguing, one of whom is Max Homa. He is $9,300, a winner on the PGA Tour last year. What do you see with him here at ninety three hundred dollars, uh, specifically with his current form? Yeah, you know, was a golfer on the rise. Uh, he's not as young as like Morikawa. He's actually twenty nine. Morikawa's twenty three, but it still kind of fits into that general idea of some time off helping some of these less established players really figure out uh, maybe what they don't have time to work on as much as they should. Uh, but he had a hot stretch of a ninth, sixth, fourteenth, fifth, and twenty fourth entering the hiatus, despite some lukewarm ball striking over a pretty large sample. Uh, but the more recent data uh, coinciding with those better results were basically coming from above average ball striking with above average putting, which is basically just kind of an all around good golfer. The question is whether that sticks after the break. Uh, he did finish twenty seventh here last year, so. I'm not putting a ton of stock into that, but I definitely don't dislike that. So $9,300 is a price that I don't think I'll be requiring a ton this week. Uh, But actually, the more I build lineups, I'll probably have to find some golfers in the low 9,000s actually to roster unless I'm bumping down to the 8,000s, which I also don't really like. So uh, I think Homa is going to be someone I play more than I initially would want. Uh, in hopes that the current form sticks around. So any thoughts uh, for you on Max Homa? Yeah, um, not quite convinced. I think that for me, it's not, there aren't guys who I like who are, you know, this this salary or lower outside of the guy we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, But there are guys right above this, like Kevin Kisner's $9,500. I'd rather do whatever I had to do to get to him or, find the $300 to get to Billy Horschel. And like you said, like $300 is, is a non-trivial number on in a really good field. So I'm not like trying to dismiss that, but like if that means that I jump down from, I don't know, like if I jump down from like, I wouldn't even pick Mark Leishman over Colin Morikawa, but like if I had to do that, that's a, it's an adjustment I'm willing to make to go with a Billy Horschel over a Max Homa. So I think that's kind of where I'm at. Um, 
I could see myself using a share of him, uh, but like it would more so be a differentiation play more than anything. I want to talk about my golfer here, though, and we can talk about this this tier as a whole because, like you said, I think that's not the best tier. So let's talk about Joel Damon because with how well he was playing before the break, Joel Damon probably didn't want the layoff to happen when it did because in the final two events before the layoff, Damon finished fifth both times. That was after a 14th at the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. And those finishes for Damon came even though he wasn't necessarily doing well in the greens, which is something that I want to account for because I'm not expecting to be good as a putter. I'm expecting to be bad. But he actually lost 1.6 strokes putting at the Arnold Palmer, still finished fifth there. And that's what happens when you gain 7.2 strokes in approach. The problem is that the worst surface for a bad putter for Damon is bent grass. So the putting woes could very much rear their ugly head again. That's why I can't say that like, oh, I'm just going to use Damon in this tier because like there are very serious blemishes that I expect to continue for him at $9,300. So are you in on Damon and where do you rank him relative to Homa? Um, probably that's tough because I want to trust the ball striking, but I really like the all around performance from Homa entering the break. So I might put Homa first uh, above the two. Damon is just in this range. That's where we start to get to these guys who have a lot of question marks. Yeah. And if you look at like the win odds and the way that I do things is not just match win odds to salaries, but I think off the top of my head, there's no golfer below at or below 9,000 who's, odds are better than 100 to 1 to win. So the win equity just drops off a table, uh, both in the the actual betting market, but then the simulations, whether, whether, like which, however you want to look at it. So the farther down we go, the tougher it is. Yeah. And you mentioned $300 being non-trivial. You basically can do like Max Homer, Joel Damon, take your pick, plus Rory. Or you can do John Rahm and uh, Ben On or Billy Horschel at 96. That's the same price. Yeah. Or Xander and Scotty Scheffler, that's the same price. Like, yeah. if you're looking for, like, high-end win equity, I know that, yeah, Max Homa, Joel Damon, these guys can, in one iteration of this event, uh, finish pretty high. But really trying to maximize my, like, win equity here in a tough field, as much as it's, like, is hard to think I'm not going to play Rory in my main lineup, I might not play Rory in my main lineup. I think that there is... Well, there is credence to that even before talking about like the opportunity cost because of like the long layoff and we don't know there are just so many yeah. unknowns like there's there's value to that thought process because of that but also when we're talking about this if it gets me out of this low nine thousand tier then i'm more willing to do it so i think that i like the eight thousand tier more than you do but we're both on the same page that the low nine thousand range is just it's not good um And I think that's something that will impact the way that I'm building things, whether it means dropping down more or paying up a bit more to get away from the guys at around $9,300. It's not even necessarily that it's not good. It's that nobody's really, nobody really separates from anybody else. And there's no cash game option in that tier. Right. And like some of these guys will finish well, but the odds that you hit on the right guys is not super high. And that's kind of where I'm getting at with, yeah, you know, Joel Damon can finish top 15. Cam Smith can finish top 15. Like, this can happen. But I really think in, a, in a, the, the tougher the field gets, the more it makes sense to kind of balance your lineup out a little bit more. Yep, I think that makes sense too. Let's dive in here to see what bookmakers are saying about this Charles Schwab challenge. Starting off at the top, we're Rory McIlroy, the easy favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. He is 8-1. to one. Then it's John Rahm and Justin Thomas by themselves at 12 to 1 and 16 to 1, respectively. Bryson DeChambeau is next up. He is 22 to 1. Brooks Kepka and Webb Simpson are 25 to 1. Then Dustin Johnson and Patrick Reed are 28 to 1. Sung J M and Xander Schauffele are out at the top group. They are 33 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook. So let's talk about Rory here because he is the favorite. He is the highest salary golfer on FanDuel. How do you view Rory McIlroy in the field, especially? relative to someone like John Rahm? So Rory is definitely a cut above everyone else. Um, Whether you kind of adjust for the layoff or not, there's really no reason to expect Rory to come back and be just not engaged, uh, especially with all these majors coming up. Uh, So Rory is easily the number one. It's just a matter of how good you feel about your ability to hit on the other golfers coming back in that lower tier because 
you can't really play Rory and a balanced lineup unless your balanced lineup is like all nine thousand dollar golfers, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, but that's not usually the way that I think of a balanced lineup. It's usually in that sense, Rory plus you know, someone even like Xander or Sung Jay and then balanced from there. So yeah. if you're going with Rory, you kind of yeah, you might get the winner, but you're gonna have to hit on your other five golfers. And that's it sounds a lot easier than it ever is. So yeah. that's always the problem. Yeah, and I think that I guess like for tournaments, I still want to build around him. Um, I get what you're saying. I think that the only the only thing that it changes for me is my exposure level because normally in this field, I would have Rory at like 80% exposure because I'm okay building around a dude and just kind of like wasting away a week. Um, if he doesn't do well, like that's not a huge issue for me personally. If your process is different, you should account for that. But like mine, eh, whatever. Uh, also with Rory, like, He's finished top five in every event he's been to since September, which is only seven events, but like that's still seven straight top fives is disgusting. So the odds that he torpedoes you and takes you out of contention are, are not as high as they would be for other golfers. So I think that what I'll do is take that whatever max exposure would be to Rory and lower it to account for the layoff and still give myself some leeway to have a lineup burst out if he doesn't do well. Uh, so just lowering exposure, but still building around him. Yeah, I, look, he's got the highest upside in the field. He's got the highest floor. Uh, the question is, if you're building... So for tournaments, he's definitely in play, even at higher ownership, because yeah. you can differentiate in other ways, and Rory's not really a risk to miss the cut, hopefully. I mean... Uh, uh, but if you... If you pl- cut if that you clip. In, <laughs> Let it die. He's jinxed. He's cursed. If you plug in Rory, though... Uh, you have 9560 for your other five golfers, which is basically you either live in that 9000 range, which has options but isn't super appealing, or you start digging into that lower range, which, again, yeah, any golfer can win an event, basically. Not some of these guys at the very bottom of this, but it's the odds that you kind of hit that 6 of 6 because you're forcing it Rory, it just plummets. Yeah. So I think this week the question is more, yeah, Rory, you can play him in tournaments. The question is more, are you jamming him in in cash games no matter what? So I tried to build a cash game roster while you were talking. Because, uh, again, I don't listen to you. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> while you were talking. And I started off with Rory and then built from there. Based on golfers, I am very okay using for cash game rosters. And when I got to the end, I wound up going ROM instead. Because the... The final golfer that it got me was a lot more palatable. The $300 there made a big enough difference where I was willing to go wrong there. So I don't know if Rory will be my cash game golfer, but the pool of golfers I will consider is so much larger in tournaments that he's still going to be my firm core stud for tournaments, even if he's not in my cash game lineup. Yeah. I, I, it makes sense. Like I'm not saying fade Rory. I, right, right, right. Rory's the best play in the field, and there's no there's no conversation about it. It's just a matter of is the best cash game lineup one that includes Rory. It's very easy. You can make the case for it. Yeah. Uh, but you have to kind of convince yourself to play a lot of these other golfers who they're just a it's a big teardrop right around that ten thousand dollar range, and we yeah. can't really lie about that to ourselves and for me as of right now the answer is no uh is rory the optimal in the optimal cash game lineup i don't think so i'm going to tinker around with some other iterations of it uh but for right now i would say the answer is no and i'd rather go like it was it wound up being rom here because like that's how it worked out but yeah i could very easily see him not being in my cash game lineup yeah i i it sounded it sounded weird to think about but i think that's where i am now uh, we've seen a lot of movement here because I think people are pretty active in the betting market. Yeah. <laughs> people might be a little hungry for some golf, uh, as we saw with the match and stuff like that. So, uh, what movement have we seen since things opened up at FanDuel Sports? But I think the most, the most relevant window here is since the contest went up, which I believe was like late Friday. So have you seen any movement since Friday until now on when, or Monday afternoon? Yeah, a lot. I'm not going to read everything because it would take me forever. I'm just <laughs> going to try to hit on some of the bigger ones, some of the ones more near the top. But uh, 
as as far as guys who's irrelevant golfers whose odds have shortened, that's Brooks Kapka from twenty nine to twenty five to one on FanDuel Sportsbook. Jordan Spieth, uh, your boy, from forty two to thirty five. Uh, Chez Revy, your boy, your actual boy for once, uh, one twenty to one hundred. But then we've seen a lot of guys have their odds lengthen. Rory from seven to eight, which is always just noticeable, um, still a pretty heavy favorite. Bryson from 18 to 22, Webb Simpson from 22 to 25, Dustin Johnson 25 to 28, Ricky Fowler 29 to 35, Xander 29 to 33, Mark Leishman 31 to 42, Colin Morikawa 31 to 45, Scotty Scheffler and Tony Finau 34 to 40. So, really, that, what that kind of means to me is it was a like take your pick kind of a open. Uh, or at least as it was on Friday. And then when people started betting, we saw right. who wasn't getting action. Right. So it seems like who's getting action is probably a lot on Brooks and Spieth. Uh, and then probably not like nothing overly uh, con- like probably not a ton on anybody else is, it would be the kind of the read that I have. And I think that as a result of the way that you were talking about it, like it's probably just like pick your poison initially um, where I think that, it shouldn't. It shouldn't push us to believe that Rory will be un, under or less popular than he should be, right. just because he lengthened. Like he's still the heavy favorite. He's still the most, the highest salary golfer. And your research has shown that both those lead to a yes. golfer being the most popular. He's still going to be, I would say, probably the most go- popular golfer in the field. Yeah, by far. Yeah, I would say. So don't let that make you think he will not be popular. He's going to be popular. Correct. Just a, a note there for sure. Uh, which lower yeah. salary golfers have odds that stand out to you? Um, again, there's not a ton in terms of the the golfers who are super cheap uh, from a DFS standpoint. Uh, again, no golfers below nine thousand dollars have odds better than a hundred to one, which is a full on long shot, especially in a field like this. So, uh, I mean, golfers who are realistically kind of in the conversation are all right in that low 9,000 range, which is the range that we weren't really in on. But there are some golfers with 65 to 1 win odds, which are not terrible. Uh, but that includes Kevin Kisner, Joaquin Neiman, another young guy who could maybe iron some things out, Abraham Anser, Joel Damon, Harris English, Max Homa, Ryan Palmer, Maverick McNeely. Uh, Christian Bezadenhout is 80 to 1. But as far as anything relevant, I'm not going to list off guys who are like 120 to one uh, just because they're cheap. So sorry, uh, but I don't really think that makes sense here. Um, So maybe that does speak to that low 9000 range being a little bit better than we think. But uh, I don't really know if this is enough to get me in on that low 9000 range anyway. I looked ahead to the player picks and neither of us has anybody in the low 9000 range there. Uh, So if you had to pick one, who would you go with? Of the guys I just mentioned, um, probably Homa or Neiman. Okay. What about you? Um, Kisner? Well, I mean, Kisner, if we include him. Um, I, I feel pretty good about Kisner. Uh, he's in my player picks. But, like, of the guys below $9,500, I guess it'd be either Damon or Answer. Um Answers at least accurate off the tee. That's good. He's not terrible with his approach. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's enough to like. I don't feel inspired by it, but like, I guess it's kind of like a eh, sure, whatever type type thing, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I can read off golfers who are nine thousand or cheaper. Nah. Uh, okay. <laughs> we'll talk about cheaper guys in the player picks, uh, but like, I think it's worth noting that like the odds fall off. Like that in itself yeah. is noteworthy. And it is, and that's yeah. why I don't want to. Yeah, I like Eric Van Rooyen more than the next guy. Uh, I like him a lot, but I need to limit my exposure, and I don't yeah. think that he's part of the best lineup I can build. Shots fired. The best single lineup. I'm gonna send him that audio clip with no other context attached. I'm just gonna come out. I him. hope. I I've been looking for his, his uh, joggers. Uh, I want some of them. <laughs> it's very specific. Oh yeah, yeah. They were, they were pretty. <laughs> You, you call from... them joggers and it threw me off. Just... That's what they are. I know, but like it's a weird term. Whatever. Uh, weather, nothing to be concerned about, thankfully. Uh, winds Thursday will be 
beneath five miles per hour to start and then rise throughout the day. Never going to get higher than 10 miles per hour, though. Friday's forecast is pretty similar, so no major advantage for any particular wave from a tea time perspective. On the weekend, the winds are never projected to get above 10 miles per hour, so might be a bit less windy than usual at courses like this. Uh, so potentially lower scoring than usual, but regardless, uh, no weather that is noteworthy for this weekend. So let's dive into our player picks for the Charles Schwab Challenge. Brandon, who do you have in the upper in the upper salary tier? So I'm going to go with John Rahm. Uh, again, I have Rory in his own tier, but I'm fine with John Rahm in a cash game. I'm not really fine with anyone else in this range until you get to Xander to start off your cash game. So it's kind of, look, we like, we like Brooks. We always love Justin Thomas, who we didn't really talk about much. Um, fine with Dustin Johnson in tournaments, but if it's not Rory in a cash game, it's going to be Rom or down to Xander. So I really want to kind of, uh, emphasize Rom here. We already talked about his form at colonial, uh, but he's 12th off the tee, uh, 14th in approach and strokes gained over the past 50 rounds, 46th in fairways gained 14th in good drive rate. So it doesn't really fit the, we're looking for like accurate golfers off the tee, but you know, he can be. We, we see that in the data. The good drive rate is really uh, the telling stat for me there. He's going to be able to overpower what's available to him, still hit those fairways. Uh, and he's actually a better, he's a pretty good uh, bent grass putter, rates out better than Rory does. So I think Rom is the only one who's really in the stratosphere of Rory this week. I'd agree with that too. Uh, I mean, of the golfers who are 11 1 or are more expensive, only two are in the top 70 in driving accuracy the past 50 rounds. One is Rory, the other one is Rom. So I agree that like if you're looking for course fits, win equity, whatever it may be, those are your two guys. And that's why I'm okay jumping down to Rom for a cash game lineup. But to me, it is all about Rory. He's my first player pick because, again, thanks to the layoff, it has been since September since Rory finished outside the top five. That is seven straight events. That's stupid. He can bomb it. But again, he's not a sprayer. He's 44th in accuracy the past 50 rounds, according to Fantasy National. Fourth in approach. Second in scrambling. The reason to maybe not go all the way in, like again, maybe lower exposure a bit, is that he has no course history here. Rom does. And again, it's very good course history. And with the layoff, we just know less. And when we have less information, I tend to lower my exposure. So that's reasons to be a bit lower on Rory, but I still think that something around 60% is fully appropriate despite that for me on Rory McIlroy. Tournament exposure estimate, Brandon. I know it's still for early in the week. Yeah, but if you had to guesstimate, where do you think you'll wind up? Um, For tournaments, uh, I'd still want to be higher than the field because I know what his upside is. Yeah. Surprise, so though, around 40 uh, so lower than you, um, probably not the majority of my lineups, but I mean, I, I can build lineups with Rory where I still like the lineup. It's just, it's not how I want to build my core lineup uh, yeah. for, for a head, like for our bobble hat. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'll get there. Uh, maybe I'll talk myself into some, some cheaper options, but uh, I think for now Rory's fine for me not being someone that I build around in cash games. I would also say that for single entry tournament rosters, I would go Rory there over Rom yes. because I am more okay with specifically Emiliano Grillo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he opens up a lot of stuff, and I'm more okay with him in a single entry tournament. Uh, but for cash, maybe not. Yeah, I was gonna say it's kind of like Rory and Grillo versus correct Rom, Rom and, and Van Roy. Yeah, or Van Roy. Well, I don't know, Chess is. 87, yeah. Uh, moving on to our other higher salary golfers, who else do you like here? Uh, Colin Morikawa. Uh, so I'm going to kind of play into that idea that I'm going to bump down. No, it would have been Xander, but I'm going to spoil your next pick. You picked Xander already, so I want to make that clear. But Sorry. Morikawa um, uh, just kind of fits what I'm looking for, the young guy who can probably fix some of the things in this game that weren't weren't quite on par. And what was up to, like, up to par was the ball striking and you really can't uh, fade that. Um, I'm not saying that he will come out with elite ball striking 100%, but uh, I'd rather have, you know, to fix the short game than, than the ball striking in the, in the iron play. So for $10,400, I think Morikawa is one of the more underpriced golfers this week, uh, and I'm going to build around him quite a bit. Like I said, in that tier, if I do wind up like, 
going with an approach that leads me to this tier, more Cal would be the guy I go to there. If I go into that second tier, my guy is Xander Shoffley. He's he's a top guy there for me. He's more known as being a bomber, but like he's not a total sprayer at the same time. Um, and his history here is pretty bad. Uh, two missed cuts, no finishes better than 48th. And I'm hoping that what that does is keep interest in Xander muted. Probably a fruitless uh, endeavor because people tend to like Xander quite a bit. But regardless, I can I can hope. Uh, the big flaw for Shoffley for this course is that he's 88th in accuracy, but he's also 18th in approach, 11th in scrambling, and 24th in bentgrass putting. That's over the past 100 rounds. And we know Xander comes to play in the toughest fields, and this qualifies as being that. So I hope he flies under the radar more than usual due to the red flags. I'm not expecting that, but like... I'll be in on him regardless. Uh, so give me your pitch on Xander. I know you liked him too. What was your process that led you to him? Um, again, just kind of like the the idea that he's young and can kind of fix things, and he also doesn't have a whole lot to fix. It's yeah. more the short game. Uh, the around the green play was there. Uh, that was always one of the things that worried me about him because while around the green play is the generally the least important of the four strokes gain stats, it still matters. And we're not going to have fans down like to – tamp down all the rough green side you're gonna have to kind of be able to play uh from some disadvantageous positions so i wanted to see that and it's there uh for the price i think he's uh probably the best value in that eleven thousand range so he's gonna be a core play for me it might be my highest down golfer this week okay let's move on to another uh the, let's move on the mid-range actually golfers who are between like ten thousand two hundred dollars i cheated, I cheated. <laughs> And the low 9,000s. Uh, it, it makes sense with the Morikawa pick. So who is your pick yeah. here? I mean, I, I took Morikawa as a high Yeah, no, no, I'm guy. saying okay. I'm saying you're right. I'm just explaining in case it was weird. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, okay. So this, this again goes with kind of what I've been saying. Mm-hmm. Scotty Scheffler, though, $10,200, uh, only 23. Entered with some very clear places he could work on his game. <laughs> Dreadful putting. Uh, but other than that, top 40 in all three T to green stats, uh, entering, uh, I guess the players, uh, 57th in fairways gain, but 22nd in good drive rate. So leads me to believe that he can put himself outside those fairway bunkers and, and into position to hit these small greens. So I think that he's in play for a, a made cut for sure, which is definitely something he won from someone who's at you know $10,200. But, uh, there's some upside if the short game kind of, hangs around and i think he's 31st in greens and regulation in this field which i'll take uh so scheffler fits that idea of going a little bit more balanced than i typically would as does your next golfer uh is bad putting a prerequisite for being a heat check favorite yes okay good just making sure so scotty scheffler can be there putter i don't yeah i mean yeah i think that's just it's just required victor hovland's potentially not a bad putter i don't know um it's hard to tell it's a really small sample so i don't actually know but he's in a really really good tier which can be tough but the stats are perfect for this course because hovland ranks 13th in accuracy the past 50 rounds and that is on top of ranking seventh in approach he's been brutal around the greens the short game again is a concern and in this range though you're gonna have to accept something bad for hovland it happens to be him around the green so we have to acknowledge that, but the ball striking is really good. That makes you a heat check favorite in general. Uh, $9,800. It's a good tier. We talked about how that's why we're not into Kevin Na. Uh, and that's worth noting for Hovland, too. But I think at 98, I am willing to go here for sure. What about you on Hovland? Yeah, I like him uh, quite a bit. I think, yeah, he was one of the golfers who I would have written up, but you okay. already where you were at the sheet first. Look, he knows. He said that his chipping sucks. Like those were, <laughs> those were his words. Um, but he's, I don't recall exactly where I saw this, but I'm pretty sure he's been working on his chipping, which makes sense. And again, this is, this is the kind of uh, situation where I'm trying to take advantage of mm-hmm. a young golfer with everything, but kind of one area, whether it's putting or around the green, I'm not really looking to say maybe this guy learned how to drive, or, you know, play with his irons at an elite level. So, you know, if we, if, Hoffman brings what he can typically do with like decent short game. He's going to pay off his $9,800 price tag. Right. 
Uh, the one reason I almost did not write up Hovland was because I was interested in Billy Horschel. So I'm glad you decided to write up Billy Horschel instead at $9,600, your second mid-tier play. What pushes you towards him? Yeah, not not a young guy, but uh, this is going to be a range. Look, we I, we keep saying we don't really like the low 9,000s, but that's because I'm fine with the, the mid to upper 9,000s, and that's a pretty clear distinction. Uh, to me, there's a big drop between like these guys and the Max Homas and whoever else is down there. So Horschel, 20th in fairways gain, 22nd in bent grass putting. Uh, he's got pretty good win odds in my simulations, despite like the more middling price. And I know that the, the recent form was falling off, but uh, the large sample for Horschel is still pretty good. Uh, 19th and 34th here the, over the past three years. It's not, of course, the same exact course or setup or field, but I feel pretty safe with Horschel. Uh, there's a tinge of top 10 upside for him. So, for the salary, Horschel, uh, another reason why I'm really interested in a, more, in a more balanced build. And I think that he fits really well for a cash game build. Um, I like Horschel there. The reason that I'm not super concerned about that funk he had was that the long sample is really good, but also the, the sample immediately before the break. He had gotten, it seemed like, over it. Like, he had a couple of top tens, um, had some good approach numbers in the final four events, so... I'm okay overlooking it uh, personally, and I think that's why I'm okay with Horschel and Cash. I also like Kevin Kisner for Cash Game type rosters. He is a former winner here. He got that back in 2017. It's one of two top fives and three top tens for him at this course, and those were a long time ago. You know, 2017 is, I know it's like one of the more recent events of this course, but it is objectively a long time ago. But Kisner's form is good too. He's 28th in accuracy, 52nd in approach, 24th in scrambling, and that's on top of being the fourth best bentgrass putter in this field over the past 100 rounds. So I think there's a lot to like about Kisner. I think that both he and Horschel are cash game plays. I am okay having both in the same cash game lineup. If it's one or the other, I might pick Kisner, but like honestly, I don't care. I think if I have the hundred bucks, I'll go up to, to Horschel. I think that either way, they're both options. Uh, what are your thoughts on Kevin Kisner? Uh, not super in on him, but also kind of just view him a tier above the rest of that, like sure. low 9,000 range, the upper eight. So going to have to like kind of take a stand and bump down a little bit uh, so that I'm not playing someone I don't want to play. Uh, and I think for that reason, I'm going to have, more Kevin Kisner than I want, sure. but it's because I'm be- I feel better about Kevin Kisner than I do our boy Russell Knox or <laughs> someone like Keegan or Brendan Steele. Like, I, I don't want to play many of these golfers in the 8,000 range with a whole lot of confidence. I did not even know Keegan was in this field. That is how little he is popping on my sheets. There he is. All right. And th- and that's him. how that's how good the field is. Keegan not is that 109th Keegan. in approach the past 50 rounds. What are you doing, my friend? What has gone on? <laughs> Oh, man. Um, yeah. I think that uh, the drop-off is really bad after Kisner. You, would you go Neiman over Kisner, I'd assume, at 95? I would because I love Neiman's stat profile and just Neiman in general. Yeah, the reason He's I had would... time to work on his abs. <laughs> what else could you want? Um, went, the reason the I went Kisner over Neiman is the accuracy. Uh, Neiman not great there whereas Kisner is, so that's the one difference, but I'm not opposed to either. I would put Kisner above Neiman. I think I actually would go Billy Horschel above Kisner after rethinking about it, but we know, whatever. Uh, moving down to the value tier, guys at $9,000 or lower, who do you have there? Uh, Adam Hadwin right at 9000 Uh So he's at the top of this pricing tier. It's just not a super strong tier, even if you kind of bump up to like 93 or 94 and look down. Not a ton of win equity. It's 0.7% for me, which sounds really low, and it is, but it's also so higher than a lot of what these other golfers down in this range have. But look, we know he's accurate. He's 26 over the past 50 rounds in fairways gained. He's good on bent grass. He's 18th there over a 100-round sample. Uh, Good sand splits, which I don't really look at too much because it's you have to hit a good shot and make the putt for CN numbers to work out. So hopefully we get some answers long-term uh, for better sand data, but I really want to emphasize some balance. And I think Hadwin still fits that because realistically I'm going to have to spend down on one or potentially two golfers per lineup. Uh, but I'd be fine if I spent down for one and it was just for Hadwin at nine and 9,000. Yeah, I think Hadwin is really well-rounded. I like that for sure. 
Um, has seen the course before. He played here in 2017 and 2018. Not bad uh, form before the layoffs. So I think that Hadwin is someone I'm very okay with. Uh, my favorite value play is Shez Revy because it's kind of like he's an automatic play for me on a non-distance course, which is what we have this week. The stats for Revy line up super well. He is ninth in accuracy, 16th in approach, and 53rd in bent grass putting. And Chess did have some missed cuts over the winter, uh, kind of similar to like a Billy Horschel type thing. But he finished off well uh, before the stretch, in the stretch before the layoff. Finished 25th, 10th, and 29th respectively. Gained at least 2.3 strokes in approach in two of those three events. So he's not the highest upside guy. And I think that that is a really good criticism of a Chess Revy play. But got great odds making the cuts uh, and getting a top 25 finish for this salary. So $8,700, I would be very okay with Chez in cash, and I think that I'm okay with him for tournaments too. Uh, Brandon, your thoughts on Chez Revy, $8,700. I wasn't super into him, um, but I see the case for it for sure. Uh, it's just, there's not a lot of upside, but there's also kind of misleading safety with just some of the short game numbers and, and the missed cuts. So, I mean, look, if I, if I'm down here, I'm going to go first and foremost to Eric Van Royen, but yeah. I think the second place below 9,000, so discounting Adam Hadwin, probably going to be probably going to be Revy just okay. out of kind of obligation. I, I think that if those are your thoughts on Chez, I can understand why you're more inclined to go balanced. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't want to. I don't want my. I don't want my first week back to hang in the balance of, of what Chez Revy does. Very fair. Uh, who else do you like as a value play this weekend? Like is a strong word, but Emiliano Grillo, we've talked about him a ton, but there's not a whole lot else down here. Uh, Matt Wallace is 7,900 if you really want to punt play, but we know Grillo is an elite ball striker. He's third in approach over the past 50 rounds, and he's really only playable on bent grass, which is what he has this week. Accurate enough, uh, 16th in fairways gain, so he's he's one of the like three to four options i would consider and that kind of sums up my view of this week uh the, the first week back yeah i think the reason that i thought the eight thousand range was good was because there were got <laughs> like definitively guys i could point to who i'm like okay i'm very okay with grillo i'm very okay with Revy, very okay with van royan but like from a volume perspective you're right there's not a ton um i think that's that's fair. Uh, but let's talk about Van Royen. We have not discussed yet. Uh, a lot of uh, unknowns with Van Royen, given that we have small samples on him. That hurts our read on both his accuracy and his bent grass putting. But the approach numbers are good enough to make me take a swing here because Van Royen is 23rd in the field in approach the past 50 rounds. And a lot of that's against tougher fields. Over that sample, he is 54th in accuracy. He was 59th in accuracy on the Euro Tour last year. He was 1.36 percentage points above each field's average. So he's at least not terrible off the tee from an accuracy perspective. So for $8,600, I think Van Royen upside is there. I think that because I know more about Chez, I'd be more willing to go with him in a cash game lineup. Uh, but for tournaments, I'd rank Van Royen higher. And I'm very okay with Van Royen straight up for tournaments too. Uh, what are your thoughts on EVR? I like him. He's he's a top tier ball striker. We've seen that enough data to know that uh, the struggle comes in the short game, which definitely problematic. But if you're taking some risk, it's, it should be more on someone like Van Royen or Grillo who can get to the greens, and then just a matter of whether they you know get up and down, uh, make their putts. Uh, pretty balanced as a driver. 52nd in distance, 54th in fairways, uh, and actually has the highest uh, win odds in my simulations among. Golfer's price below 9000 It's not particularly close, although it's 1.4% for him. I think the next close, there's like two other guys above 1%. It's They're not high odds when you get down this far. So Van Royen's at 1.4%, but he's 120 to 1 to win. I've, I've taken notice, yeah. Oh, okay. Just making sure. Just pointing that out. Although uh, I would recommend in a field like this, more of a top 10, top 20 kind of a vibe. No. I would bet nope. EVR to win outright. Nope. Although, nope. I mean, nope. we could see a lot of those joggers come Sunday. I mean, it doesn't matter for me because all the casinos are closed in New York still, and that's all we have here. So it doesn't matter for me. But, like, <laughs> just point it out. Yeah. This York State is less backwards. Uh, win picks for this week. I almost forgot that we had this thing because it's been a decade since we've done this podcast. 
So I don't know who won the last bobble hat. I don't you know did. when the last bobble hat was. Did I? The Arnold Palmer. Wow, it's a long time ago. You went. You you snapped a. I won. <laughs> I had won seven in a row, and then you won two in a row. So, good. Uh, if you wait on with bated breath for bobble hat updates uh, for our head to head that we have throughout the year, we've decided to inc- extend this year's season <laughs> through the Masters to give me a chance to make up ground. So, <laughs> for those of you keeping track at home, and I know that there are. At least 0.3 of you keeping track at home. Just note that. It's going through the Masters <laughs> this year. All right. So let's go one golfer anyone you want. And one golfer 50 to 1 or longer because this field is weird. Um, like I don't want us picking Chez, basically. Uh, so you can have – should we toss out Rory or no? I mean, you're the host. I always I'm trust asking that you. Because you're, you get to make these picks too. Let's rule them out. Okay, so no Rory, and I'm taking Rom. Okay, that was my fear. Yeah. Um, I could have tossed Rom out too, and we could just have a free for all. But like, we didn't talk about a lot of the other guys all that much, so. Yeah. Um. So fifty to one or longer. I mean, I I did this before the show because I knew you were gonna say fifty. Yeah. Um. But even then, like, the golfers with the best win odds for me are not golfers I love. And if I'm actually looking for winners, like I don't want to go with Horschel. Uh, Van Royen's up there, but I might go Gary Woodland. (sighs) Even though I don't, I don't really like him as a DFS play at 10, three, but I think the win equity is probably the right play there. Woodland's 42 for me. So let me pull up the actual odds here because there's someone I want to see if they've lengthened. Uh, Yeah. Von Taylor's, 250 he's good <laughs> oh that's upsetting um who was it uh mark leachman's 42 what are you talking about what did i i, I didn't say anything you said you said you wanted leachman oh you said woodland i'm stupid sorry <laughs> they're the same person in my head in my defense okay so matthew fitzpatrick lengthened but not long enough he is still 45 there are a lot of goal like i'd take more cow in a heartbeat but he's 45 so yeah um. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just looking at these. Uh, Victor Hovland. Okay, so you got Hovland. And who else did you take? Rom. You took Rom, huh? Because you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I asked right. you if you wanted to include Rory, and you let me take Rom. So, like, this is yeah, this is on you. I know, but that's all right. Um, because Xander's gonna win anyway. So. Oh, okay, cool. If we had tossed out both Rory and Rom, I probably would have picked Xander. I know. So it's not that's all right. Well, that, that gets me the winner in a way. So I'm good. I mean, with you it. win by picking Xander. Like even if he doesn't win, you win in your heart. I probably bet Xander every time he's in a field, which is like <laughs> seems like eight times a year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's all we have for today. We ran a little long because like we had a lot to discuss, but I think that's okay for this weekend. Uh, so Brandon, any final thoughts for you on the Charles Schwab challenge? Uh, anyone who says they know like what to expect coming out from any golfers, I would just be very curious about that. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, added variance to golf, which is already high variance. So, I mean, if you feel great about fading Rory or jamming in Rory into every lineup, I can't really knock it because nobody knows what to expect here. So uh, trust yourself, but also kind of uh, brace for the idea that we don't really know a whole lot. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that like, if you're talking about like other sports, like my model for NASCAR, it was okay. uh, A couple of the first races back, but it didn't really like round into form until this past weekend in Atlanta. So like, we're going to need the sample to get larger before we say like, with definitiveness like this person should be the favorite this person is a value and i'm going to go 90 percent on them like it's okay to admit we don't know things and you should react and adjust your dfs lineups accordingly yeah there's a lot of look if you get to the point where you can say look i don't know everything and neither does anybody else and that gives me some leverage that's a really good way to be when it comes to DFS. Absolutely. That is all that we have for today. Once again, though, make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed because NASCAR podcasts come in Tuesday and Friday. 
back with more PGA podcasts every week until whenever. It's going to be a while, and it's awesome. Nice to have it back. Nice to get to talk to you again, Brandon. It's been fun. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you, too. Uh, if people want to yell at you on Twitter, I'm not saying ask questions because, you know, whatever. If they want to yell at you on Twitter, where can they find you there? I'm at Gadula13, G-D-U-L-A-1-3. And I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. It is nice to talk to all of you again. Hopefully uh, you are safe, you are healthy, you are happy, and things have been going well for you and your family. We're glad to have you back, and hopefully you can have some good lineups to track this weekend. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire.